If you heard the words, hear ye, hear ye, and then everyone stood up, where would you be? Courtroom. Courtroom, exactly. This is, this is easy. You can answer these. Um, if you heard the words, let's get ready to rumble, where would you be? Wrestling. Wrestling or boxing, yeah, something like that, yeah. If you started reading and you read Once Upon a Time, what would you be reading? Fairy tales. Fairy tales. Easy. You all know those. Those are pretty easy. Uh, every culture has these catchphrases that kind of orient you to what to expect, right? If you were in Japan and you heard some kind of catchphrase, you might not understand it, but you're in America, you know these, just it's easy, you know what it means. Um, if you were in ancient Greece, you might not catch it if they had one of those catchphrases, but the ancient Greek people had the same kind of catchphrases as we just said right there. One of the phrases, this little hyphenated, got two words, kind of a word and a half, hyphenated phrase. Uh, Homer used it 2,800 years ago. Aristophanes used it 2,400 years ago. It's in the Bible 2,000 years ago. And all those Greek speakers back then, even the Romers, Romans kind of took this over, this idea. Whenever they heard the phrase, ev angelion, they knew exactly. And just as much as you know, let's get ready to rumble, they knew exactly what would come next. Ev angelion. Do you know what that meant? It meant... It was the way to announce a military victory. Ev angelion was a technical government phrase. We won. We have peace. Ev is good. Angelion is message. Good news. That's where we get the word good news. Uh, this particular good news is we don't have to fight anymore. We have peace. Ev angelion is a description of the coming of peace. Now that gets really messed up in English when evangelical Instead of peace, for some of us, it means run, run away, run away. Um, some of us, that's what it means. Um, and good news, the same, that's what the same word, good news, where that kind of, it became God's news or God's story in Germany was God's spiel, and God's spiel turned into what word? Gospel. All those things are the same. Gospel, evangelion, coming for peace. All those things are the same word originally. And back in Greek, uh, in, in the time when everyone spoke ancient Greek, about 35 years after Jesus died, Mark decided to open his book, not with a Christmas story, but with the word evangelion. It's the first word of the book, first sentence of the book. As Fran said, this is the evangelion about Jesus, the Messiah. This is the good news of peace in Jesus the Christ. Christ or Messiah, by the way, another word that everyone in that culture would have known, it means the anointed one. And who would you anoint other than a king or a general on the way out to go lead something, to start something, to, to, to have a war, to run a country, whatever it is. So anyone in that culture which heard Mark's first word, there's no way around it. All they would have heard is, this is the victory of peace for the one chosen to wage war. That's how Mark starts. The victory of peace for the one chosen to wage war. Which might raise the question for you, what war? What war would Jesus have been fighting? Certainly not a military war, because anyone in Israel around those times, they, they were already, they were still being occupied by strong Roman forces. There was a lot of political oppression against the Jews. The temple would be destroyed right around that time. And only someone with insane hope could ever imagine that Jesus would actually lead a military war. Some people thought that, but that's not his, not his deal. So what other kind of war could there be? A war against death? There is a line in, in the Easter story that Jesus conquers death, but Mark doesn't really write about Easter very much. So it's probably not that. Uh, spiritual warfare? Some people would point just in the, in, later in the same chapter, Mark 1, you see Jesus uh, tempted in the desert for 40 days right along with Satan. So maybe there's spiritual warfare, but there's a lot in between those two stories, so it's probably something different. Verse 1, uh, this is the good news of Jesus' victory. Verse 2, and it began just as Isaiah had written. So here's the war. Um, the war is, there's this weird guy, it was going to be John, shouting in the wilderness, pointing to a highway coming for Jesus to show forgiveness and new life. That's the definition of what John is doing, forgiveness and new life. And that is the peace that Mark is declaring here, forgiveness and new life. That's the victory of peace that will start with Jesus. The beginning of our peace is the grace to be and the space to become. The grace to be forgiven in this world, the space to become what our new life holds. And that is so much deeper than weapons and rulers and laws and power. Although if we really embrace that kind of Jesus peace, it will change our perception of what should be with weapons and rulers and laws and power. And if we really embrace that kind of peace, it will lead from in here to out there peace. From inner peace to something in the world that changes. 
And Mark is declaring from his first sentence, here it is, real peace in this guy. Isaiah talked about it 600 years ago. John pointed to it 40 years ago. Jesus was enacting it. And now prepare yourselves to follow him and embrace and live peacefully. Which is such a good preface for Christmas, even without a birth story. Except, Mark, how do we live more peacefully? That should be our question for Mark. How, is, how do we live more peacefully? We've read books in, in our book club that, that, that point to this is where your life should be. Well, how do you get there? Uh, which is an enormous, enormous question. There's a thousand ways we could live peacefully. So what I want to do is back off the big picture and just put for how can we, in this season, hectic, uh, frantic season of Christmas, how can we have more peace in that? Uh, how through the twists and turns and expectations and hills and valleys of holiday stress will we do that? A couple ideas. i got four ideas. A couple of them come from John. First of all, what was John wearing? Camel hair. Camel hair. So this is clothes he made himself. Someone else said another thing back there. I don't know. And, and, a, and a goofy bit. He made his own clothes. Whatever those things were, he didn't go to, to Walmart and buy them. And so maybe our, our way uh, of peace through the hyper-capitalism of Christmas, the struggle for shopping is to back away and give each other things we can just make. If you aren't artsy, make food. If you aren't a good cook, make a CD of, of, of music the person would like, or, or buy Daniel's CD later on uh, today. Uh, if you aren't techie, make a fruitcake, whatever it is. This, is. this could be a place of peace. You could, uh, the gift can carry more meaning. You can save money. Peaceful Christmas 101 from John, pointing to Jesus. Make stuff. Uh, number two, where can we find peace in the holiday season? What did John eat? Locust. Locust honey. Okay, so the next time your kid's stocking, pour some bugs and some honey into the... No, that's not the, that's not the advice here. That's literal Bible, and this is why we don't follow the Bible. Literally, is don't put the dog honey there. Um, Christmas is often such a time of gluttony, right? We gain so much... And, and I don't want to get away from... Like, there are good things to eat on Christmas. If you have gluten-free goodies, you can put them on my desk anytime you want. Thank you, Jim and Alicia, for whatever's in that little tin right now. Um, but... Imagine the peace you can create in your body if you weren't gluttonous, but you ate well during the holiday season. Maybe more peace in the environment by eating sustainably. Maybe, maybe more peace with farmers by shopping directly. For instance, instead of you know, that big box of cheap chocolate uh, that comes from wherever, you could purchase a small box of local quality chocolate. Instead of a tin of processed cookies, a box of fruit, something like that. Third, this one doesn't come to John. But you ever hear something on a podcast and you just, you have to share it. And, and I have an outlet for that right here. So you're going to get my podcast um, hint here. Um, parents and grandparents. How many of you have ever given to your kids or grandkids money? Just money, right? Okay. okay here, here's how we're going to do this. If you were going to give the kiddo $20, this year instead, give them $30. And some of you are thinking, this is expensive piece. But here, here's, the, here's the deal. Three envelopes with $10 each. One for spending, one for sharing and one for saving. I want you to imagine the kids opening those and you having a conversation about how to share that $10. Where is the world hurting and broken and how can you, young person, uh, take part in, in uh, fixing that? How can you build peace through that $10? Maybe it's a, a loan on kiva.org. Maybe it's sharing that $10 with a food pantry. Maybe it's giving it to, to a homeless person for gas. I, I don't know what it might be. You, could, you and the kids can come up with that. And, and then the next week you take that $10 for saving and. Um, how cool to bring a kid, piggy banks are great, how cool to bring a kid to a bank and start a savings account where they can get that little update all the time and continue to save and see that process. I promise any of the kids that are here, um, Grace, adults, the biggest stress in our life is almost always money, and so if we can teach the kids her age how to deal with money less stressfully, imagine the peace that comes in the world for them. Fourth and final, another one directly from John. Um, John the what? Baptist. Baptist, all right. Uh, his baptisms, again, were a ritual about forgiveness. What if instead of, you, every one of you in here, you get this boring card from some family member that you can't stand. I get a lot of boring cards from family members I can't stand. What if instead of just sending those back and forth, you asked actual forgiveness with that little brother that you fought with for so long? Uh, with your mom that never things never seemed to work out. Can you imagine what a gift, a real gift that would be to offer each other forgiveness like John was doing for the world? Or your coworker, write a note. I'm sorry I moved your cheese. And you can put that little note with the candy you made. <laughs> we carry so much of this interpersonal junk with us. 
We carry these heavy burdens of pain and resentment and guilt. We look for all these silly ways to validate our anger. What if instead we use this holiday season to take part in forgiveness? I'm sorry, I forgive you. That could be good news of peace in Jesus the Christ. I hope so.